Hello, I'm Jim Lampley. Welcome to this look back at Lewis Tyson, one of the most memorable fights in 30 years of boxing on HBO. When Lennox Lewis and Mike Tyson finally met, years after they first might have, and both on the dark side of 35, their fight was a preordained watershed. For Tyson, a chance to wipe out a decade of misadventures with a single hard punch. For Lewis, a chance to cement his legacy by obliterating a myth. The preview was a brawl on a stage in New York. The movie was an urban action adventure, a courtroom drama, a frenzied road flick, and then a knockout. There was no logical reason in boxing terms that a fight between two guys past their primes should have counted for so much. But because fans thought it did, because this fight had been building for a number of years, then it really carried a lot of weight. But everybody felt that Mike Tyson was still like Mike Tyson was 15 years ago. The general talk on the street was, Mike is back, Mike is from the streets. Yo, man, Mike is just too much a man. He's too much of a dog for Lennox. We all seem to need a threat from outside the other who is dangerous and who can hurt us. And we need the champion who can save us from that. Lewis, he should win. He's bigger, he's stronger, he's highly skilled, but he doesn't have that magic. That's why Tyson captured people's imagination. That he knocked people out. Mike Tyson stunned the boxing world with his punching power when he turned pro in 1985. He was still a teenager, just a few years away from a troubled childhood in Brooklyn, New York. Tyson's story was familiar. Boxing would save him from the streets and make him a star. The youngest ever heavyweight champion at the age of 20. And we have a new era in boxing. Shortly after he became the heavyweight champion of the world, he became the poster boy and did ads. Knock drugs out of your life by just saying no. Just not sham a diet Pepsi. Mike Tyson. <laughs> Uh, he was well-spoken, uh, had a nice smile, a little gap tooth, but a nice smile. He was a charming young man. No, no, time, no, they should get fighting rings because you can't walk the street with him. <laughs> he was gathering enormous momentum as a public figure. The crowd was magnetized to him. When I go to big cities, everybody stop, you know, and it's like, wow, Mike Tyson. You're Mike Tyson, aren't you? Aren't you that young knockout kid? You know, and it's like, wow. When he started to become popular, uh, he would talk to me about girls, and if girls would find him attractive, that he felt ugly. I remember sitting in traffic, people coming out of their car to give their daughter's phone number to him. Then it was the limos and the girls and the parties, and there were always people surrounding him who didn't help develop the sweeter side of Mike. I'm with Robin Givens, who was attending our first Mike Tyson fight as Mrs. Champion. <laughs> Robin, uh, inquiring minds want to know, how does a woman who went to Sarah Lawrence and Harvard Medical School wind up falling in love with a guy who's a graduate of the School of Hard Knocks? God, I want to know too. In 1988, Tyson formed an unlikely union with actress Robin Givens. But as quickly as it began, their marriage ended eight months later, with Givens accusing Tyson of being manic depressive and physically abusive. The question came, what is the best punch you have ever hit anyone with? And then he started to laugh. I said, why are you laughing? He said, because the best punch was a right backhand that I hit Robin with, and she, she hit every fucking wall in the room. At his peak, Tyson was terrifying. A master of destruction who paralyzed his opponents with fear and amassed a captivated following. But in 1990, a 42 to one underdog, James Buster Douglas, would hand Tyson his first shocking loss. At the same time, Tyson's chaotic personal life became front page news. In 1992, he was found guilty of rape and sent to prison. 
where he would discover the Islamic faith before being released on parole in 1995. As I've told Mike on many occasions, man, when you got out of jail for that rape beef, you know, all you had to do was clean your act up, man. You could have been the greatest thing since sliced bread. But no, coach, I, I want to roll like I want to roll. The pimps, the hoes, the druggies, those my people. GQ Puck, fuck them. I don't care about them. When he was released from prison, this man became even bigger than life. When most people are down and headed in the wrong direction, he became more famous. The public and much of the boxing world, I think, had invested so much in the myth of Mike Dice, and so it didn't take much you know, to convince people oh, he's back. But underneath it all, it was, uh, there was a lot of dry rot. Mike Dyson decided that he was just going to go on this kind of circus tour to fight anybody's because the public had this fascination with him. He was just going to go for as much money as he could make. After prison, Tyson was still a box office bonanza. Not so much for his abilities, which he put on display against dubious opponents, as for the frightening behavior he had begun to exhibit in the ring. The bizarre ear-biting incident with Evander Holyfield came first, and that was only an appetizer. And the fight with both of them, you know? Both kept, you know, messing with him. So, hey, I'm gonna break his arm. Asked him at the press conference, did you try to break his arm? Yeah, I tried to break his arm, so what about it? And then he's in against Lou Savarese, and Savarese is out. And the next thing you know, he's pounding him anyway. The referee's down, you know, and he's just sitting there saying, you know, this is like a five alarm fire here. This is a guy who's having a lot of trouble controlling himself. To the general sports fan, boxing is supposed to be about violence and no fighter was more palpably violent than Mike. And then, of course, there's all this flamboyant tabloid material, which our society feeds on. And so he satisfied people on a lot of fronts. We were drawn to him. It's not like Mike Tyson broke into our house and said, watch me, okay? So everything repulsive and bad and negative about him must also be in us because we were drawn to him. Tyson's notoriety eclipsed the recognition of Lennox Lewis, whose journey had been very different from Tyson's. Ironically, before their paths diverged, they came together to spar as teenagers. And Tyson's trainer, Customato, made a prophetic prediction. Customato would say, these guys are gonna meet in the future. So I said, that'd be interesting. But at that time I was saying, but I, don't, I hope I don't meet this guy, you know, cause he's like an animal. Born of Jamaican descent in London, England, Lennox Lewis spent his youth in Canada. He arrived in Toronto at the age of 12, and it was there that he discovered boxing. Lewis took his time in the amateur ranks and earned two trips to the Olympics for Canada, winning gold in 1988. In a way, Lennox was in finishing school when Mike was becoming a global figure. Lennox Lewis was one of the best right-hand punches in the amateurs. Everything you want from an Olympic gold medalist, Lennox Lewis had the package. I beat the great American superstar, Riddy Bowe, and knocked him out. And the winner is Lennox Lewis. All of a sudden, you win the Olympics, everybody wants your autograph, and you become important. In 1989, Lewis moved back to England to turn pro. Lennox Lewis is in total command now. And scored his first important victory against Razor Ruddock in 1992. Six weeks later, with Tyson in prison, Lewis won a vacated title. Abandoned by Riddick Bowe, who had no interest after the Olympics in fighting Lewis again. Lennox wants this belt. He must get it out of the garbage, and uh, then we'll be calling him the garbage picker. That was a, a, a coward's way out. Why don't you just say you don't want to fight me? Why do you have to go through all that? In his fourth title defense, Lewis would lose the championship to an unremarkable opponent, Oliver McCall. He won it back in a bizarre rematch, but would spend years trying to overcome the stigma of that first loss. That's gonna be it. In 1999, Lewis became the undisputed heavyweight champion after defeating Evander Holyfield. The prospect of a clash with Tyson loomed. Talk to us about your future. You know, I want Tyson. 
definitely want Tyson, you know. But in 2001, another unexpected loss to Hasim Rahman would stall his ongoing quest for respect. Between his wavering focus and foreign passport, Lewis was a hard pill to swallow for American fans. The enigma of, of Lennox is nobody knows really who Lennox is. He's a man with many passports. I was born here, I grew up there, I fought for the, the Olympic team over here. If you're a citizen of, of, of everywhere, you're a citizen of nowhere. The promotion that used him with his uh, pinky sticking up in the air. Tea time, Mr. Lewis. Lovely idea. Accented the negative. Will your mum be at the fight? She never misses about. Another thing about Lennox Lewis was he played chess. For goodness sakes, the heavyweight champion playing chess. Because Lennox has a British accent, the notion persisted throughout his career that he was somehow more civilized than Mike and therefore he wouldn't be the same kind of destructive force. He's a nice guy and he's a great guy and that's why I like him. Well, yeah, that might be why you'd like to have him over for tea. <laughs> but, you know, being a great guy in a dollar fifty will get you a ride on the subway as far as being heavyweight champion goes. By late 2001, Lewis had regained the title from Rachman, and Lewis and Tyson were the only star heavyweights still standing. By finally meeting, Lewis would get a chance to cement his legacy, and Tyson, an opportunity to get out of debt and justify his rage. I was going to rip his heart out. I'm the best ever. I'm the most brutal and vicious and most ruthless champion there's ever been. My style is impetuous. My defense is impregnable. And I'm just ferocious. I want your heart. I want to eat his children. Praise be to Allah. There was a tremendous talk about this fight happening. Lewis versus Tyson. And so many doubters because Lennox Lewis is tied to HBO. Mike Tyson is tied to Showtime. How on earth are these two networks who are rivals going to join forces to enable this fight to happen. The fighters wanted it, the public wanted it, and seeing the great potential profit to be made, the two networks, after extensive negotiations, finally agreed to come together for an unprecedented joint pay-per-view broadcast. The fight was set for April 6, 2002 in Las Vegas, and in January, a press conference was convened in New York City to announce the plans. I said to a guy in our entourage, he looks pretty mean there. I mean, he just looks mad. And then as soon as Lennox came out, Mike just came across the stage. He took off his hat, threw it on the ground, and started marching over to me. So I'm saying, I don't know what he's doing. My security came out, stopped him. Mike commenced the punching, Lennox commenced the punching. It was like an uh, all free for all. Somebody was biting my leg. I'm like pushing the head, realizing, you know, Tyson's biting my leg. He's biting my leg. I hate getting bit. So. Part of him was like, I'm going to hype this fight. But part of him was trying to encourage himself. I am in my 30s. I am four or five years away from a competitive fight. This man is up to the mark. Let me look into the eye of the tiger and see if I see any wavering. And I don't think he saw any. And so it degenerated from there. He knows that he's a jerk. He knows that he's been taken for a ride by all the people around him. That's what makes him angry. And when he's yelling and screaming, you can almost see him crying because he knows that this is not where he wants to be. I'll fuck you till you love me, faggot. Yet he doesn't have the wherewithal to pull himself out. Him and I took a walk outside, and as we're walking down the street, he turns to me, he says, it's going to make the fight bigger, isn't it? I said, yes, but this isn't what I wanted. And he said, but it's going to be bigger. And I said, yes. One week later, as a direct result of the press conference melee, the fight was put in peril when Tyson was denied a boxing license from the state of Nevada. Nevada turning down profit, Las Vegas turning down money on moral grounds. When Nevada turns you down, a place where prostitution's legal, you know, it's a little tough to find some place to go with this fight at that point. Other traditional boxing states also declined, including New Jersey and New York. But after several months of searching, Memphis, Tennessee finally agreed to host the fight, which was rescheduled for June 8, 2002. In April, Tyson opened his training camp in Maui, Hawaii, and the few journalists who traveled there found Tyson's behavior as raw and unchecked as ever. 
I may like Fonny Cake more than other people. It's just who I am. I sacrificed so much of my life. Can I at least get laid? You know what I mean? I've been robbed of most of my money. Can I at least get a blowjob? Well, Tyson, enough was never enough, no matter what he did. And this was almost accepted as just part of the show. How confident am I doing that you can win this fight? Are you talking out of turn? <laughs> no, I think we're all talking together. I normally don't do interview with women unless I fornicate with them. So you shouldn't talk anymore. Unless you want to, you know. It was just watching a man reduced to his rage. I wish one of your guys had children so I could kick them in their fucking head or stomp on their testicles so you could feel my pain because that's the pain I have, waking up every day. It's part frustration, it's part fear, it's part performance, it's part hype. Mike is a salesman. Mike knows what put asses in seats. Mike knows controversy does it. Once in Memphis, great efforts were made to keep the fighters apart, including separate press conferences and weigh-ins, which dramatized how volatile Tyson was perceived to be. But when he arrived at the arena on fight night, there was a collective sigh of relief. Finally, Lewis Tyson was on. I didn't see him until a couple hours before he was supposed to go in the ring. And he was so confident. Mike was known for the intensity of his persona on fight night, the electric crackle that seemed to be going through his body and his brain as he approached the ring. And the Mike Tyson in Memphis seemed docile. I get into the ring and I see this barrier of, of bodies. I'm saying, this is interesting. Mike Tyson and Lennox Lewis yeah. separated by a cordon of security forces. Tyson was coming up to the barrier and looking over. He was looking at me, he was looking at my body. I beat in my stomach saying, yeah, I'm ready. Now they get together again as professionals as Tyson's late trainer, Costamato, had predicted they would. And here we go. I know he's going to come at me and I'm thinking, I'm not going to give up my ground. I'm the champion. Back up and come to Lewis. In my mind, that's the ego aspect of it. seems to be the aggressor of the two. Everybody gave him the first round, but he got hit with an uppercut. I mean, it really hurt him bad. He came back to the corner, and he told me, he said, Ronnie, I'm hurt. He hurt you? What do you think he was here for? You know, taking a date? I mean, you know, of course he hurt you. <laughs> now you're supposed to hurt him. Tyson fighting at a measured pace, not the whirlwind that some expect. Well, I could tell by the middle of the second round, there's no chance, there's no hope. He had to know that because I'm 30, 40 rolls away, and I can see it. Tyson's confidence ebbing, Lewis is get up, get up, seeming to grow. Lewis used his physical advantages to dominate the smaller, slower Tyson. By the fourth round, he was clearly weakened by the punishment he had been absorbing. After about four rounds, I noticed from the clinches where Lennox was physically pushing back, and you could see the little look in Mike that he'd given up. It is rapidly becoming a technical mismatch. Lennox Lewis is content right now to just stay outside, and Mano Stewart wants him to finish this. Listen to Emmanuel. Ready to get caught with some crazy shit. Step it up, the man is finished. He was actually cursing Lennox out and beating Lennox's chest. And I had to actually say, oh, Manny, Manny, don't beat him up in the corner. Because you got a dead man in front of you and you still doing this. Just let that shit go. This fight is all the way. You got a dead man in front of you. Go out there and knock him out. And I'm saying, well, this is the wrong time to explain that I hurt my hand. So, you know, while he was giving me heck, I was taking it. But there was a reason why I wasn't out there throwing my right hand. So you know, I had to give it a couple rounds to settle in with the pain. He did what he's always done, which is not put himself at risk, being the chess player, protect your king, and then ultimately say, checkmate. Going to practice, this is easy for Lewis. If he doesn't get caught with something big, he's gonna walk to victory. Mama didn't raise no fools, and he still respected this man's power. And for good reasons, he's the one in the ring with him. And no matter how hurt and slow Tyson is, he is 
a dangerous puncher. There was a little bit of the sadist in Lennox Lewis in this fight. Lennox, I feel, wanted to punish him for saying you're going to eat my kids, biting him on his thigh. Now I hit you twice hard. Pow, pow. And seeing it where the blood is coming from. Yeah, I'm enjoying this. I'm really liking this. I think he wanted to let Mike feel some more of the punishment before he put him out of his misery. The bad boy of boxing is getting spanked by Lennox Lewis. I was surprised and shocked at some of the punches that he took. Fighters fight to the end. Gladiators. And plus, Mike, you know, he's a proud brother. He's been a great champion in the past. So, you know, he's going to give it all he's got and tell us no more. You understand? Not many people can do that. You understand? Everybody can't talk in the corner. One at a fucking time. I kind of cursed at everybody in the corner, tell them to be quiet, let me do the talking. And our corner just became a mess. Nothing could have helped Mike Tyson in that fight. It was except a time machine. Finally, in the eighth round, Lewis wobbled the defeated former champion with a ferocious uppercut. And referee Eddie Cotton gave Tyson a brief reprieve when the end was long overdue. Mike Tyson was having problems, and uh, this was the time for my right hand to be really effective, so I threw it. That's going to be perhaps the end of the fight. It'll take some courage for Mike to get up from that shot. Seven, eight, nine. He's out. Lennox Lewis knocks out Mike Tyson and banishes him from the upper stratosphere of the heavyweight division. They only give you credit when you knock out people. And people were saying they didn't like the way I boxed, the fact that I boxed too safe. So for me to knock out Mike Tyson gives me a great feeling of accomplishment. He took a, a vicious ass whooping. He got one of them down home Mississippi ass whoopings in that fight. I mean, grandma's lie so couldn't wash out what he got that night. He took that beating and he didn't have to take it. He could have just said, no, no mas, because you can die in there. Let's be frank, you can die in there. That to me was like his red badge of courage. Mike, are you sorry this fight didn't take place years ago? It wasn't meant to be. I've known Little Terry since he was 16, 15 years old. I have mad respect. Everything I said was in um, proposition for promoting the fight. He knows I love him and his mother, and I know for, if he thinks I don't have respect and don't love him, he's crazy. So you're saying a lot People got a chance to see the real Mike Tyson. Mike's interaction with Lennox in the ring, in the locker room with his baby, being very considerate. No pain, no animosity, no tension in his face, no bad words. He didn't want to give him any more ammunition to dislike him any longer. Time will tell if Mike Tyson's uncharacteristic sportsmanship was a temporary response to a beating or something more permanent. And if Lewis will finally get full credit from the American public for all he's achieved. There's still at best a grudging process of respect for Lennox Lewis in America. People understand that Lennox is the, the best heavyweight of this particular era, but probably most people define that era as after Tyson went south. Tyson was not the foil to make Lennox Lewis great. Mike Tyson, certainly in his prime, one of the great stories in boxing. But by the time Lewis got him, a shell, a shell of his former self. People will be interested in Mike Tyson until they put him in the ground. He'll be fighting for money for a while longer because he won't have any choice. But he stopped fighting to win a long time ago. As an exercise in nostalgia, Lewis Tyson proved that the old stories still sell best. The pay-per-view gross of $112 million, a record for the sport. The two fighters split more than $60 million. That establishes why, in spite of the lopsided fight, there was a rematch clause in the contract. Thanks for watching The Tale of Lewis Tyson. These men are
Men are all about heart. So much of the